Jim Collison. I'm here with Mike McDonald. Welcome to our LinkedIn Live today. We're talking about how to manage better using your strengths. And if you're joining us uh, live, we'd love to do, for you to do a couple things. One is uh, throw your chat, your top five in chat. We'd love to see that. Drop that in there. Riley, behind the scenes, will bring it up on screen. And then we have a question for you. Think about the best manager you've ever had. And then give us some words, one or two or three words that or why they, what made them the best. And uh, we'd love to, th to have you throw that in the chat room. Mike, while we're waiting for some folks to join us, because it is yeah. LinkedIn, yeah. it takes a few seconds. Um, best manager you ever had, and let's have you do the exercise, best manager you ever had, what kind of words would you associate with that? Boy, that's a great question. I love it. Um, I have been, I will say in all sincerity, I have in uh, in my career, I, I've only had great managers. So I feel like I've always had somebody in my life that I could really look up to. But the things that I that really stuck, stick out to me, Jim, is first and foremost, like they don't let me off the hook. Like there may be times where I might have like a, a little bit of a space where I maybe I'm tempted to kind of just, I don't know what, downshift or ease for a while. And there's like, no, no, they, they like always, but it's not out of threat or coercion. They're always like seeing like, what's the next horizon? What's the next frontier? What's the next peak past the one that you think you've scaled and um, just always created a real opportunistic growth opportunity that was mm -hmm. out there for, for me to make sense out of. And it was unique to me. So they, they, they knew where I was on and where I was off. So I love the fact that they didn't let me off the hook. I think that it, it's just, it's an expression of value. Um, I think as much as yeah. anything else, I always felt yeah. right. Um, and I think the other thing too, is they always did a great job of um, authentically staying out in front of I think, conversations that were leading indicators of what we could do next. They, I, I, I always think about this line in the sand and it's so, so representative of the most strengths-based leaders, but they're always initiating and typically trying to reduce, if not eliminate the amount of opportunities where they're responding or reacting to things. And so um, I think I've seen the benefit of that from a, a, a lot of leaders. We're just never coming from behind. We're always just got that forward lean yeah. that Don Clifton always talked about with a strengths-based approach. We're always kind of, you know, tilted forward to what's next and looking forward to it and seeing solutions for how we can succeed to it. Love it. Those we, are a couple of spikes that really No, it's to really good. Re no, really, really good. Uh, Mike, we've got some folks checking in in the chat room. I see if, that. If you want to drop your top five in there and then... Kind of the question is, think about the best manager you ever had and what made them the best. Some words Carol had mentioned uh, inspires, right? The, that um, for me, I think the term, I, I get enabled, right? I have a manager uh, who can enable me. And yet, to your point, who can bring accountability. Because enablement without accountability is just chaos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I, that that it's and it's such a fine. It is a fine line too. But yeah. I, I love what you're saying, and I was look, I was thinking about what Carol was talking about with that inspires. But you know, you know, we talk a lot about the leadership uh, style of coaching, right? I mean, it's you know everywhere, and and it should be. But I, I I'm pretty convinced. And I think we would agree that if we coach well, we create ownership at the center of every coaching conversation we have. And I think Jim, that's exactly what you're talking about, where there is accountability and expectation wrapped into that sense of ownership where I can be, I can, I can be the engine of, of success, right. but yeah. it's, it's kind of my, my ownership is on display. Like I kind of have to own this thing because in the conversation I've clearly committed to it. I love so, it. We're going to talk some more yeah. about that here in just a minute, but if you're, if you're just joining us, jump in the chat with your top five, uh, maybe some words that describe mm -hmm. the best manager you ever had um I, I think Lori, let's see if I can find that one. Um <laughs> both Riley and I are clicking on these. So Jim, managers who develop maximize Jim. max potential. I love that. And so that's you know, this idea. Heather says uh, provide support and direction at the right times. Mm. Love that. So continue to continue to keep those coming. Um, we're gonna spend a bunch of time here how to manage uh better using your strengths. Yeah. Uh I'm here with Mike McDonald. Mike, let's get to know you a little bit today. Sure. Give us a little bit about what we pay you to do at Gallup and, and maybe a little bit of your background. Yeah, love to. And Jim, I'll, I'll pour some gas on the fire that you've started here. So if, for those of you in the chat, like just think about key words. Don't even worry about a phrase or a sentence. Just like, what are the first two or three words that popped to your mind immediately to Jim's invitation? Best manager you, uh, you've ever had and just key words that are characteristics, attributes of who they are. And we can 
drive off of that. Yeah, off, and Mike, off of that, if you're you know, stimulus if, response on display, I think folks are listening to this in the podcast form. We do have a Clifton Strengths podcast. If you haven't subscribed mm-hmm. to that and you want more content like that, after we're done today, just go search Clifton Strengths podcast and get it subscribed. Um, if you're listening in your car, maybe you're on a walk listening to that. Well, I want you to think about those words now before we dive in, maybe identify a few in your own mind as we go forward. But Mike, let's get to know you a little bit. Yeah. Again, a little bit of your background. What do we pay you to do here at Gallup? <laughs> yeah. So officially my title is Gallup Senior Workplace Consultant. Um, I think, Jim, what I try to translate that to mean in a, as succinct a way as I can uh, is to help organizations learn better so that they can lead better. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot in between that learn and lead space about what that really looks like from the organization level down to the individual team uh, team level. And there might be a bit of my strengths bias coming out in some of that uh, style of expression as well, Jim. But um, yeah, and just for full disclosure, since we're all exchanging our, our top five, I am ideation, input, learner, achiever, and focus. So I think my strengths probably reveal themselves um, as much as anything in my my title and my job description about how I see my role. Great. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, Ranger, Woo, Maximizer Communication and Activator on this side. You see what a hot mess uh, that can be. <laughs> Mike, as we talk about how to manage better using your strengths, I think the, the very first question we got to ask is what makes a good manager? And we got a lot of data around this. Mm-hmm. So talk a little bit of it briefly, but talk a little bit about it. Just think, what are those things that makes a good manager? We have lots yeah. of comments coming in, but, but what makes the- them great? Yeah, that the the comments are just on fire. You know, Jim, if I was just to drive off a theme that I want to take advantage of, I think if we saw a key, uh, I guess I won't say listen for, but a perspective in the chat, authentic has come up. I think is kind of the the leader of the pack so far, and I think there is something when we think about strengths and what makes a good manager, and that being comfortable in who you are, like clearly who you are clearly who you are not and not getting tempted to to blur the two but i think a good manager um you know to your point that data it's it's a tough uh it's a tough job that's not getting any easier um so i'll just put a little context to it so right now uh what makes a good manager is they've got to persevere through maybe some of the challenges and points of resistance of the workplace but um the the threat if we don't do this well is that managers are no more engaged than the teams they are leading so if we look at engagement across, you know, all of our measures, managers are eyeball to eyeball with the teams that are leading, which is a losing proposition. We will not move organizations forward unless the most vital feature of our organization's culture actually um, is pulling in our favor. So managers, I, I like to think about this, Jim, they have to consume these types of experiences so they can create it optimally for their team. We've got a gap there. But in, in terms of what makes a good manager, a couple things that really, I think, are um, pushing their way to the front of the line. And we're seeing this over and over again, but honestly, how effectively are they? Where's their capacity to lead through change and transition? And I don't mean that to sound like trite or cliche, but we've all learned those lessons in the past 24 months and still continue to about change and transition. But I think I would hope that our ability um, or positioning of change and transition, not as something we simply survive, but I think there's opportunities that we should, we can, if we're good managers, seize really actively, and I maybe even say aggressively, that every single change in transition, regardless how comfortable or uncomfortable it is, whether it was done with intentionality or something that we're reacting to in the marketplace, is always a growth opportunity. Uh, development was something we uh, uh, developmentally maximize or max our maximization of development was one of the uh, key phrases in the uh, chat. How do we see change and transition as development opportunities, as growth, the capacity to do something better than we've ever done before. That means everything now, we can we convert anything to you know, a, a wildly new opportunity. It's not just simply something we have to figure out or survive on the other side. And I think that's where strengths, right? I would actually put that as maybe one of the key considerations for managers when we think about our strengths. Which of your top five or top 10 strengths causes you to lead through or navigate change most effectively with your team. And I don't know that we should ever stop asking ourselves that question. Maybe it's a different strength for change and transition relative to those circumstances. So I think about that a lot, Jim, as it's a primary calling and managers have to translate that capably and effectively. Mike, when we, when let's, let's dig in a little bit on that. When we think about the power of strengths on teams, how, how, how can managers really take full advantage 
you know, we have sometimes we have folks take the Clifton Strengths tool. It gets printed in a report. It gets put. They talk about it one time, and it gets put in a drawer. H how can managers working with their teams pull that report out and continue to use it in a way that's that's powerful for that team? What are just some tips? Mm -hmm. I, I so um, I love. Let's start off with kind of the the theme of that attitude. I I really like our leadership stance around strengths. You've heard this from a variety of our thought leaders. I'm a huge fan of the statement, but um, our strengths are for as as managers as leaders our strengths are kind of for us but they're really for the benefit of our team and so it's that you know it's that call to action and, and jim i know with even your work with kurt leesfeld a long time ago he talked about how do we give our strengths away and i think that's a great leadership attitude now let's think about this in reality so i'm ideation number one that doesn't mean i can instill that as a strength in everyone on my team who doesn't have ideation. But what I can do is I can sure help my team think more creatively than they would otherwise. I can help them innovate, invent, uh, think outside the box, um, be a little more ambiguity tolerant. And maybe if they think they're faced with only two options, maybe we just invent a third option and, and just have that attitude, you know, that flexibility where maybe we crowdsource our creativity once we pool mm -hmm. our resources. And so there's there's a shift, there's a mindset shift as I as I hold myself accountable to how do I give that strength away. So I think when we know that about ourselves, I would encourage every well-intended team leader, keep pulling out that Clifton Strengths for Managers report and think about what's at the core of each of your top five strengths and then how do you commoditize that? And what would be the evidence? that it's actually showing up to move the success of your team forward with that type of approach and attitude. Mike, so that's one, as we set the edges, Jim, I think that's where the best of yeah. some of that examination can translate. We've got a manager, uh, we've got a team, they've taken Clifton strengths. As you, as you work with managers and you work with a lot of managers around the world, what's a simple tip for, for a, a new manager who may not be in an infrastructure where they're getting some direction, but they may have this, or they're maybe thinking about about getting this for their team. What would be an, a simple tip just to get a manager started with their team using those reports mm. in a team setting? Yeah, so um, I, I what, there's just there's so many organic opportunities developmentally that I think we have the the chance to take uh, full advantage of. I will. I, I do want to say I think you know, Jim, we need to keep leaning in on this because if we use our strengths well the very involvement and execution of our role at a high level is the best learning opportunity we're ever going to have. And I think strengths really causes us to see that with wide open opportunities. I think, Jim, as we, if we were to coach ourselves as managers and to really think about where are our strengths in action I, and, and seeing our team's strengths in action, I would encourage us to think about just, just two simple questions. Okay, Every month, I would love it as a habit and default if every manager would just pause and think about their team and simply ask and answer, um, what have I learned about my team in this past month that I didn't know before? So, so it puts us in that position where we're studying our team and not just studying our team, but we're studying their interpersonal dynamics, we're studying their preferences, where they show up at their best, um, and we're, we're capturing the evidence of success accordingly as well. So what, what are we learning about our team each and every month? And then I think, Jim, the most important follow-up on that is how then does that change the way we lead our team moving forward? And then my strengths intuitively respond as I ask and answer those questions. And strengths is the study of success. So when we look and examine our team and map our own leadership involvement through our own strengths contribution, I, th I think it keeps us really uniform and driving forward. And uh, again, the performance-based ways that we know categorically qualify as strength. We saw in the chat a lot of answers like accountability or like mm. support yep. in being there. As we think about a, a, a manager using their own strengths and then a team that may be aware of theirs, and we think about career development, right? We just passed through this time of the great resignation. Everybody's changing jobs and they have new, they have new op not everybody, but a lot of people sure did, right? And we've got some new opportunities or some new developmental opportunities. How can we use that information, Mike, from a developmental standpoint? Mm -hmm. How can a manager really start building in developmental opportunities to, for their team members kind of around their strengths? Yeah, no, it's 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 terrific. So first off, I think it's such an important discussion because um, we really need to get our head right about what development actually is. 
And I think we're doing a great job of elbow, elbowing our way past um, the tra- the stereotype, the unfortunate um, trapdoor stereotype of, a, of development. So, Jim, the world keeps trying to say without any evidence that development is explained by, did I get a promotion and am I getting paid more? Which inevitably may take me out of that slipstream of where I'm absolutely at my best, right? But we're going to push somebody to lead a team because that's the only opportunity they have because we've defined and restricted development to simply that. And so, Jim, I think if we redefine development, you know, qualitatively around what our research is saying, development is just is in large part the leading indicator to anything we want to have happen is simply, am I getting better at my job? So let's start there. And how far can we go, right? Maybe forever. There's deep mastery and expertise out there. I think you and I are strong examples of, you know, of, of that. And then um, is it happening on purpose? Not just is it, you know, not just am I getting better, but, you know, sometimes I don't want it to accidentally happen where I had to, you know, out of circumstantial uh, conditions. I want to know that I've got a partner, a collaborator, a manager, somebody working with me to make that, that uh, getting better at something happening on purpose. And then we need to have evidence of success right? That, that it's predicted excess, um, success that we saw happening. And that propels itself forward in a really loud way. Well, now all of a sudden, Jim, when we think about um, this broad band of development, what, you, what we all find is our very best have an almost insatiable appetite for feedback and an almost insatiable appetite to create broader and bigger impact. Well, how do we do that outside the role? And I think there's, you know, we kind of, we call our core coaching performance alignment, but it's useful if you think about how much horizon we have developmentally with the people on our team um, as they find success in their role. That's terrific. And I think there is self to role coaching comparison that we can create. And there's a strengths awareness, right? What's the output of my job expected to do and how do my strengths drive that? But then Jim, at some point, maybe I really arrive at an elite level of that individual level of performance, but I have an appetite to create bigger impact and develop in that extension. Well, Jim, align me then. Well, Mike, what's the impact do you think you could have on the team now? Beyond your role, what? how could you help others as you transmit your success to where, where would that benefit mm-hmm them. And so now where would my strength start to extend? And maybe that gets into more partnership, collaboration, um, knowledge transfer, mentoring, who knows where that could show up. But now there's a whole nother series of chapters that we could write in terms of my development. And let's say I really get established there and I really have a presence and an identity around that. The third then chapter, I think, where we can continue to add then is such a role to, we have role to sell, role to sell, self to role, self to team, and then go self to organization and now be thinking about, well, how, how many bridges can I cross or how many cross functional types of um, impact can I create as I just, you know, um, aim and add the value of my own experience, mm. talent, skills to um, how we can all now move forward. And that just, oh my gosh, for, for the best of the best, again, that that's the appetite. That's where they want to go. And, and literally in our coaching, we haven't had to take that person out of their functional role at all we've just been able to keep using that as the genesis for all a genesis for all these things to happen mike i love the theme of what you're talking about there as we think about teams that are functioning well together knowing who they are knowing their roles and responsibility and then how they're deploying their strengths right how they're deploying these themes in a way that for powerful teamwork and they begin to stop thinking about their own success and begin to think about the success of others and then we always know that's what the success is way more powerful in the context of relationships, right? Yeah. As, as people are, as you're having group success, that has, that has the ability to be infinitely more powerful in what it can do from an organizational standpoint, instead of having one person succeed, right? One person rise to the top uh, where those tides are rising, you know, mm-hmm. all ships, right? From that mm-hmm. perspective, we want to take some Q and A from the chat room here in a second. I might mm-hmm. have a couple more questions for you. So if you've got some questions, throw them in the chat room and, and Riley will identify those for me. But Mike, as we were talking about development, and as I was looking at the feedback we were getting about best managers, n- uh, there were some comments about people who don't micromanage. And yet in in ind- individual development, sometimes it takes some micro-individualization 
to make that work, right? So when we think, what's the difference as you think about the difference between micromanaging and truly engaging and developing a team? Are there uh, are there differences that we can we can identify that help people see the difference between the two? Because I think sometimes they think they're developing and they're micromanaging, but we want to continue to say you got to be engaged, right? Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think uh, so. A couple of things, first and foremost, and we all this is a strengths based audience, but this is this is where I think you know, Jim. Early on, we set the edges. Like, where am I my best as a leader? How do I commoditize my strengths and create that optimal impact? But we all know the other edge of this, where I think the boundary shows up, which is in the language around those blind spots. Or I think specifically, Jim, when I talk to a lot of audiences, I lean heavily on that one in thirty three million number. So if we think about this. And you all know it. I'll say it just for the good of the order. The odds of Jim and I or anyone having the same top five strengths in the same order are one in 33 million. Um, As we set the edges of it, that's recreational math, maybe. But what it really teaches us about leadership or manager behavior is the fact that on my worst moment, um, if I was to make a, a really lazy assumption, I would be better off assuming every single person on my team sees and interacts with the world in the exact opposite way that I do than to start to assume that they see it in the same way that I do. So I think, Jim, then what that allows me to have an appreciation for and to your question is that I need to, I better find out what what the motivational core that represents each person by their strengths, not mine. Where are they emotionally charged? And that then plays itself for Jim to your question, because here's what we know. What releases me from being a micromanager, if I'm operating those blind spots, I can't figure this out, Jim, because you and I had a conversation. I told you how to do it, and it's my way, and it's worked for me. But I haven't spoken any of your language. I've limited you. You're working really hard. The gains are incremental if they happen at all. And so I'm a micromanager and I'm just having to step by step, hold your hand to push it all the way through. The other thing that it actually um, disconnects from is let's think about our definition of somebody who's categorically engaged. If somebody's categorically engaged, they are involved, they're enthusiastic, and they're committed. Now, think how strengths explains, right, how involved I'm going to I'm going to volunteer my effort. Uh, think about the um, uh, if they're involved, they're enthusiastic. Think about the emotional charge. Think about strengths and how we feel when we get to use our strengths more often. And in that commitment, right, that we see we, we have a, a progression, a momentum around our strengths that follows through, that sees success on through the finish line. So I like to think about the economy of all of this, Jim, and I think of it, it works dramatically in the favor of an of a effective manager. But if my team is involved, I don't have to recruit effort. So I get time back there. I'm not a micromanager. If they're enthusiastic, they're already emotionally charged. I don't have to run around and give these wild pep rallies and halftime speeches, uh, et cetera, to motivate them. They carry that with them. So there's another release I don't have to micromanage around. And if they're committed, this is where really, if they're committed and they feel like they want to and really do want to do this work versus have to, well, that commitment now releases me as well. So there's a whole repositioning of where now I don't micromanage and actually equip them so that they can own and see their own success on through. So that's the way I see those features yeah. all kind of working together, Jim. Love it. I think there's a fine line between the two uh, in some regards of, especially in a caring situation where you really you really care about the folks and you may feel like they're not getting it and you begin then to overcompensate for right. their learning, for their <laughs> development by micromanaging. I, I think sometimes we think that term micromanaging is always somebody who's just wanting to be mean or wanting, yeah. right? or they're a control freak. I think actually micromanagement comes out of uh, comes out of more care and concern right. than it comes out of of that. Every situation's different, but yeah. um, again, we're taking your questions. If you want to throw them in chat, I'm always excited to see a Gallup coaching class. So it's a GGSC in Chicago, taking a lunch break, jumping in and, uh, and joining <laughs> us today. Uh, so that's always that's always great. Quick question at times, I see managers being aware, but not fully utilizing strengths. I mean, they recognize it for themselves, but mm-hmm. tend to forget about it for their directs. Mm-hmm. Mike, I like the advice that you gave about one time a month, do a purposeful review of of your team's strengths and 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 create maybe create an action plan to to move forward with that. As we think 
any other tips in that area as we think of how can managers not just focus on themselves, but mm -hmm. really focus on the team. Other things you've seen to keep that at the forefront. Yeah, well, a couple layers. So, um, and again, I'm just going to stay as true as I can because I just love, I mean, again, this is where Don took us from the very beginning, that study of success, positioning, and attitude. I don't know if there's a better conversation to continually have about studying your team member at the individual level or team success at the collective level. Um, and then how do we use that to mass produce even more success with intentionality? And I think what's interesting, you know, one feature I would add to that is if you were to coach your team or the individuals on your team, asking them questions like, in the past month, what accomplishment, um, wh wh where did you find the most success? What was most successful for you in the last month? And then tap into it. And Jim, you talked about this, um, that emotion. And then what were you most proud of? about that accomplishment so then we get this emotional connection to an outcome that causes us then to want to repeat it because now we're starting to experience and play out this is how i will feel in the execution and the effort towards another series of success so i you know i think it's simply where what was your strongest success in the past month what were you most proud why we what what caused you to be most proud about that success which of your strengths contributed most to it and then how can we create more opportunities, more similar opportunities for that same type of outcome? So I think that's effective at the individual level. At the team level, I will tell you as a habit and default that I think broadens this back out is, um, and I love it. We did a best practice uh, series of interviews with some of our own internal client leaders who are the best of the best, trended top decile and beyond uh, engagement scores. One of the interviews I conducted with a team leader and I give her full credit. I stole this from her as fast as it came off her tongue. It was so good, but she contends that she coaches her team by asking them one question. And it's the same question as a habit and a default every Friday. And the team knows it in advance, but she simply gets her team together and she asks them, where did we see the best of our team this week? Hmm. So think about this, Jim, and her contention, and it's, she's right. We're talking about performance, best practices, discoveries, things that we, through our collective lens, added most value. But then inevitably, right, uh, underneath that, collectively, we're going to recognize ourselves as a team. So the identity of a team gets really intact. And then they start to see the agility and the insights of where, Jim, was your unique strengths contribution to that success? Where was mine? And so it's a really powerful draw for us to see our own most unique contribution against the backdrop of a team level of success, which is just a great framework and positioning. And she unapologetically says, she goes, I won't change the question because the response to it is always dynamic. It's mm -hmm. always in real time and relevant. And the third feature she adds on the other side is she contends it literally changes their behavior, not just on that Friday when they get together, but literally throughout the week, because now, Jim, I probably won't wait to talk about it with you. And I'll probably call out a moment in real time where I saw you do that thing that I think is going to matter later on. We reflect on it on Friday. So yeah, I think well, that, uh, the, the power of the habit in that conversation, right? Where you, where the team begins to each week, start to look for it. They want to begin to find those moments to share. And so instead of it getting to Friday and thinking, okay, I got to think of something, you know, what happened? They've begun to look for it during the week. A hundred percent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that expectation. So, so, but it's great because now they're they're not just collecting the evidence of the content they'll discuss. Right. They're right. creating the evidence of the content that they want to discuss. And I right. think that changes yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, that's awesome. We often spend time thinking about Q3, question three on our Q12. You and I have spent a lot of time together talking about that assessment. But that question is I get the opportunity to do what I do best every day. And I think that can be a framework managers can use yeah. in the same context and say, did you get the opportunity to do to this week what you do best, right? right? right. Uh, you can right. take it right from that. And and I love that idea of of thinking through as, as, as I worked with our interns here, I'd always say, what do we have you doing? And are you getting an opportunity to do what you do best, right? Because yeah. yeah. they're brand new. Right, they're right. brand new. We don't know with them, and so um, Jason asked a good question. I want you to chime in on. He says, "I've been coaching, okay. facilitating small groups through their strengths, but I have an up and coming opportunity to facilitate a large group uh, interaction with leaders and teens about 90 minutes for about 150. So a good sized mm -hmm. group." Mike, as we think about doing these big group things, any advice 
to the leader of those big group in saying, how can we continue to maximize the strengths investment in that form? Mm -hmm. I, I well, so a, a pretty simple framework. I think I hope Jason, keep me honest if this speaks to what you're what you're asking about. I think you can have a, an incredibly accelerated session with this with this group. Um, and here's what I like to have them do. And I, I think there's really kind of three specific chapters that you get to put together. Um, but first and foremost, get them in, you know, get them inside the report. And, you know, you kind of do that speed level of examination where um, what I'll typically do is say, hey, go to your first strength. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Skim the definition of that strength. You only get to circle, highlight, or underline one sentence or phrase that captures the best of you as a leader or as a manager. You only get that one desert island statement that you have to walk away with. And then on the other side of that, what I do is I say, okay, the best source of our content and the best way for us to learn about strengths is hearing about how somebody else uses that strength. Mm. So Jim, then what I do is I say, okay, you all have five minutes. Um, I want you to have as many cross-pollinated discussions as you can with as many people in the room. But here's the truth of the matter. I don't really care about your individual answer. I want to know what was the most powerful story, the most powerful example you heard from somebody else about what they claimed as a sentence or a phrase and how are they using that as their best as a leader. And that really gets the room revved up. But again, we're crowdsourcing and really collaborating to our collective learning. Then you, what you can do on the other side is maybe give them a, you know, a, a moment, give them five minutes to go through strengths two, three, four, and five and circle highlight or establish the best in those. That's a reflective moment. The other side of that then, Jason, to your call out is then have them think about those blind spots. And I typically will say, okay, you've had a chance to look at your report. You have three minutes read through your blind spots and identify the one, the one that threatens or most gets in the way of who you are at your best as a team leader. And then I want you to look at your top 10 strengths and think about where are you drawing from on a different strength to help offset or make sure that that's always true to its best contribution. The other side of that, then I think you can um, do lots of different things, but if you start off with the entry point to that conversation, you can then aim it at whatever output, you know, topic that you want, uh, DEI, change and transition, uh, performance development, um, manager growth and development, whatever would, um, I think, come out of that. Because you've got a really strong presence of the name, Jim. Now we've got the claim and then the aim just opens it up to where you can take the group towards uh, this accountability to doing something better than they did before. I love it. I, and what as you were talking about that, I was thinking you don't have to be a coach to do those with your team if you're a manager. Now, we've been spending a lot of time this idea of going from boss to coach, taking your as a manager, acting more like a coach in a lot of ways. And that's what that means in a lot of ways is you as a manager, uh, uh, you as the supervisor, you as the leader, you as the influencer, whatever that is in that group. Mm -hmm of being able to pull that group together and having that conversation. Mike, that could be a 15 minute conversation that opens a meeting. Oh yeah. It, right? yeah oh, without a doubt. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And it's, and again, it's eternally dynamic. Like it'll never plateau. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah. the one thing, the one call out I would, I would keep putting in front of this and Jim, you said something earlier that I think was, Oh, because you were talking about micromanager and, and yeah. the, the, the bandwidth there. I just want to, you know, I think one of the, here's why I, I love strengths. We all do, right? But sometimes I think it can be so dangerously recreational. And I just want to put mm -hmm. an edge of accountability out there for all of us that we constantly true to Don's, you know, um, you know, identification of what a strength is. Are we doing something better? Are we doing something better? And Jim, to your point, I don't think that has to sound mean. With strengths, it shouldn't sound mean, but there is accountability because the tragedy of this all, right, is it'll fade away. We'll, we'll, you know, it'll be this fleeting recreational spa day, you know, where we just simply didn't do work, but we didn't really drive anything individually or collectively. And I just think that that we keep having to come back around to a wrap. And it to, to the point where, with your point about that bandwidth, Jim, about micromanagement or not, it's always in relationship to the performance. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about our blind spots, the best way to offset our blind spots is always be mindful of the performance in front of us. And then intuition and instinct really becomes natural and comfortable because I know, hey, if we're going to present to a client and it's five minutes before we walk in, that's probably not a great spot, Jim, for my ideation to kick in. <laughs> Maybe a week before 
you know, when we're putting the deck together or the presentation or our storyline, we can take a novel approach to our uh, positioning of that discussion. But five minutes, we probably need a maximizer, Jim. We probably need something else that's on display at that point. Yeah. I just need yeah. to just shut it down. So, but that's only in the context relative to the performance. Otherwise, I'll just keep the popcorn going and annoy the heck out of all of this and maybe confuse the client in that discussion. I love it. I love it. And I think as we think about micromanagers, there's only the one thing worse, and that's someone who's not managing at all, <laughs> right? <laughs> like they're in the role, but well, no, <laughs> nobody's home. <laughs> right? You know the data on this, right? Yeah. Say no, it. I think it's an impressive story. So if we think about coaching relative to, um, if we think about coaching, uh, let's think about the the strengths of mindfulness and its relationship to engagement and how it can qualify all, qualify all of us to coach better. I'll do this really fast here, Jim, succinctly. Uh, we asked people um, if, you know, what, what was the priority of their day spent focused on? Was it focused on what they do well? Was it focused on what they don't do well? Or were they largely left ignored or unattended throughout the course of their day? The population predictably who said that they their focus on what they do well 61% on the basis of that position alone were categorically engaged. I don't think that surprises anybody. But it was interesting even going to the um, the, the uh, weakness folk focus for the course of the day, like 45%, 48% were still categorically engaged. So we're losing more than we're winning. But I think, to be honest, that was a higher number than I thought it would be. But Jim, this is where you're going to love the point you're making. We asked the up the population, um, you know, who, who who reacted and said that they were largely left ignored or unattended throughout the course of their day. Only two percent were categorically engaged. So, Jim, I like to play out the reality. Let's just play. Let's just set the uh, another table here. That means that Jim, I would prefer that you follow me around all day long and say, Mike, you didn't do this, but you should have. Or Mike, you did this, but you didn't do it very well. By 20 times more, by more than 20 times, you just saying, hey, Mike, no news is good news. I'm just going to set you mm -hmm. adrift and catch up to you later on. I always laugh because I'm like, well, talk about lowering the barrier of entry to being a coach. I mean, if I did it completely wrong, I'm, we're still 20 times better than me just turning my back on yeah. My yeah. team as well intended as that might on be. Teams. So, yeah. On teams. Well, some great information, Dr. Mike McDonald. I've got to call you that at least once here during the <laughs> session. Mike, thanks for taking the time today to be a part of this, and thanks for coming. I think we've gotten some good feedback uh, from the chat room, but uh, mm -hmm. thank you for chiming in here. I appreciate it. Yeah. Jason, keep me honest. Good luck with your session. It was a great question and uh, positioning for all of us, but you'll have a blast, I think, with kickstarting that. Couple, couple reminders on the way out before we let you go. One, if you haven't subscribed to the Clifton Strengths podcast, you should do that now. Now that we're done, mm -hmm. uh, take a second. Let us finish this. And then head out to just search uh, in your favorite podcast app. Just search the Clifton Strengths podcast and uh, subscribe to that. You'll get uh, well-being updates by each of the Clifton Strengths themes that we're currently working our way through. We almost have them all out there. And then you get content like this, some great sessions in that, including how to have a strengths conversation with your friend. Right. It would seem intuitive, but we know that has been our most listened to episode, Mike, yeah. out there. It's crazy. People want to have those conversations. And we're talking about this in the sense of managing, but how powerful can it be in the context of a friendship? And hopefully Love that it. best friend is at work. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where that's where we'd love to see it. So, Mike, thanks for coming out. Everybody who joined us live in the chat room, we appreciate you. and We appreciate your comments and your questions. If we missed anything or if you continue to have a question after the fact, send us an email coaching at Gallup .com. You don't have to be a coach to use that email address. It's just the easiest one to remember if you got a question for us or anything we talked about. If you want to take advantage of uh, in your organization, we'd love to hear from you. Again, that's coaching at gallup.com. Thanks for coming out today. Have a great afternoon or evening or maybe even morning if you've caught us on the other side of the world. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. Yeah.